Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about? everyone and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. If you liked our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore. You can download it on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to Alzheimer's Speaks, we're about sound information, not just sound bites. So we like to have, you know, a lengthy discussion and dive deep and and give you something that you can really use. And I know you're going to be able to use the conversation we have today because we're going to be talking with a woman who is living with dementia who has great great insights to our listeners our followers our community i just have to thank you every time i'm so grateful for all you do for alzheimer's speaks and helping us battle this disease uh, you guys are just absolutely amazing now, before I introduce our guest, I always like to give a shout out to a few organizations. And I also want to point out some of the recent shows we've had. All of our shows are archived. We've been doing this since 2011. So you got plenty of listening to do if that's what you're looking for. Upcoming, we're going to be talking with Erin Blight, who is an author on caregiving. And then some of the recent shows that uh, we just had was on a state planning with Catherine Hodder, who's written an amazing book and has a wonderful, wonderful family binder that you can purchase. We've talked about duty of care versus dignity of risk, which is really important when you're talking about quality of life. And we had the honor of having MD VIP on with us, who has launched a new brain health quiz, which is wonderful. In fact, I just took that. Now, I do want to give a shout out also to Artist Senior Living of Woodbury. They are doing a virtual memory cafe, so anybody in the world can participate in that. It's the third Wednesday of each month. And so October 21st will be our time at um, 1 p.m., and that is Central Time. You can call them at 612 200-0506, or you can go to their website, theartistway.com forward slash Woodbury events. Um, also want to remind people that Coral Health is still allowing people to download two of their apps. One is called Music First. The other is Coral Faith. From their sites, just go to coralhealth.com. That's C-O-R-O health. Dot com. And then, of course, the memory cafes um, are just doing such a wonderful job. It's over 900 of them, but unfortunately, there's only about 50 of them that are doing virtual cafes at this time. And you can find those at the memorycafedirectory.com. Just go to Cafe Connect to find that. And last, I just want to give a shout out to the Foot Bar Walker. Um, this is a, a walker like you haven't seen, but it allows patients dignity, it helps them build strength, and um, it really decreases a care partner uh, getting injured in terms of trying to get somebody up and moving and in a standing position with a walker. So let me introduce our guest today. Well, I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest today, Valerie. I'm so excited to introduce you to our guest today, Valerie Shackey, who is 68, and she is a feisty community physio farmer. And I'm going to ask her what the heck that is, because here in the U.S., I've not heard that term. 
Valerie was diagnosed when she was 63 with dementia, and now she advocates uh, via various organizations to encourage people to get diagnosed early so that they can have the best possible outcomes. This means helping people overcome the stigmas and misinformation and bringing hope and laughter to this terminal journey. So welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lorelei. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to be included today. I need to have you defined for us because I'm, I'm thinking I'm not the only one that doesn't know what the heck a physio farmer is. So if you can explain that to us, then we'll get, we'll get on to real life stuff here. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I was born on a farm. I'm a farmer. You can take the girl off the farm. But you take, can't take no, the way around. You can take the girl off the farm. You can't just take the farm out of the girl. So when I, uh, I was the first married mother to graduate in South Australia, and then I went back to my home, uh, we, um, halfway between Perth and Woodna, so it's really isolated. And then we share farmed for the next 20 odd years with, with my family. And I set up my practice. So that's why I'm a physio farmer. I was the only physio for hundreds of kilometers. Okay, well, thank you for that explanation. Now, I want you to kind of talk a little bit about your history and as a child and how you think our childhood helps us cope better with dementia. I think that that's a really fascinating thing to, to discover and to realize. Uh, for me, being on the farm, I was one of the younger one of, of uh, six. The one didn't survive but there was always 10 at our table. So if I had my jobs done, I was allowed to disappear for the day. So I would go off with my animals and um, my whip and, and build uh, tadpole uh, concrete things and build cubbies and go walk kilometres and discover and do. And I was involved. My, my dad was not concerned with gender. So if you had an interest you were taught and you were shown. So I was able to be involved with so many things, with the butchering out of animals, with the how to make small goods. But, you know, my mother made sure that I knew how to sew and cook a meal and, and do all of, the, all of the other things. But my role was to, um, to look after the goats and milk the goats morning and night. So when I was having my neuropsych assessment, the woman, after about the first half an hour, says, you must have massive cognitive reserves. So I have overcome all the multiples of deficits that you have. And I said, well, that is probably due to the upbringing where you were taught to be self-reliant, where, where you were allowed to make mistakes and find a better way of doing it, where you were, you were, there was no helicopter parenting at all. Um, if you got hurt yourself while well, you were dusted off and stood up and you find a better way of, of overcoming it. And it was just a matter of, I, I fear now for, the, for this next generation on that have had no, don't have the widespread experiences to lay down that foundation of um, cognitive reserves that's going to be so needed in the later life. So that, that's the background of... Um, uh, of resilience and um, and and not fearing to fail. Failure is just another way of getting it right, and and also being extremely determined. Always being a determined little miss. I've just if there's if I'll find a way. I'll always find a way. The other thing that plagues me at times, but it's also a mixed blessing, is I have a burning need to know why is this so. And so that is why I've been chasing um, all the aspects of the various dementia, the various types of dementia, the various types of treatments, the various, all the avenues. But I'm also a scientist. I, I can still read a scientific paper of any genre and give you about six points in plain speak, depending on who my audience is. And so I can work out what's the fake and what's the real deal? And oh my goodness, with the dementia now, my bullshit measure is really, really sensitive. So I'm, I don't, I don't do, I don't do fake well, and I certainly uh, 
will call people on on things. They need to show their evidence, and I guess that's why at times I'm I'm told I'm difficult by other professionals. So I find what you're saying absolutely fascinating, and you're right. It's very scary for our younger generation that does have the helicopter parents and and grandparents and is restricted and everything has to be perfect and the expectations are up here and so they're afraid to try. They're afraid to adapt and then you add in social media with all the likes and the facade of this perfect world that everyone's trying to live when that's not our reality. Um, I, I can see where that can make a huge difference in terms of forging forward. And I think we're seeing that already with a lot of the, our, our younger population in terms of how do you adapt? You know, um, we're seeing an increase with um, mental illness, with the, the social isolation, um, people not trying, they pull back, they pull in where you're still pushing you're still pushing for those answers. You you know you're still testing the limits, and you're not afraid um, to do that. And and I love when you said, well, you know, some people say I'm kind of difficult, but I love that because you're on a mission. I love that your your bullshit meter is working well, and you call people out on that. I think that's what is really needed for us to change our dementia care culture is we have to not just sit there and passively go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. We have to really think, does this work? Um, and maybe it works for one, but maybe it doesn't work for all. That's okay too, but but let's figure that out and let's be honest when we're talking about that. Um, you um, you talked about, you know, being raised in, a, in an air where, and I, and I think this is a beautiful, and I think we're seeing more of this happen now, but there wasn't the gender restrictions. It wasn't like, well, you're the pretty little girl, so this is, you're going to do the inside work, and the boys are going to do the outside work, um, <clears throat> or they're going to do the heavy lifting, and, and you're going to be molded a different fashion. I love that you were taught to, you know, follow your true self, what interests you, and we're going to help you adapt and explore. Um, how lucky were you to have parents like that? Uh, I, was, I was really blessed. Um, uh, my mum and dad didn't get a lot of formal education. My dad would have loved to have been a doctor. He was, um, he was basically the unofficial vet in the area. And my, my mother was extremely intelligent and loved her words and her... And her um, a, a vocabulary and my father would talk in King's English and he would he would challenge me with the words sometimes he'd have mercy and actually tell me how to spell it and do it or find it in the dictionary but then he would encourage me to use that word until I was uh, until it, it was familiar so I have I have a huge vocabulary and I'm often told, told that I talk very posh but I'm thinking well if you if you have a correct word to use, why don't you use it? But part of the dementia and the difficulty with word finding means that there's a watch and a call. It's a, um, you know, something's or something's or whatever. So um, I'm told that I'm needing speech therapy, but I'm going to be needing one who, who's very um, able to pick the high level of it. The um, yeah, no, my my parents. We're, we're a beautiful Christian family and solid values and never never put you down. My mum, if she didn't have a kind word, she didn't speak. My, my father had health issues and, and, um, and grieved the loss of a son and, and, um, and found, it, found the comfort in a bottle. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't all sweetness and light. Uh, but he was, I was 10 when he became sober. But I was his little, I, I, he made a harness for me for my dog. I trained the dogs, I trained the goats, I trained anything that would let me train it. Because uh, I, I love being outdoors. I was outdoors more than, than I was indoors. But I also loved to read. And, um, and if you had done your jobs and you were found on, your, on the bed with your nose in the book, you weren't told off. But if you hadn't done your jobs, it was a different matter. But we'd have, we had enough for social gatherings. You know, 
playing darts, playing cricket, playing football. Oh, these were the days. I'm a really, really good AFL footballer. But ladies weren't allowed to go out on the paddock and play. So when, um, so when there was the first AFL Women's Grand Final nearby in uh, the Gold Coast, I went up and I barracked real, like, real loud and real hard. And the irony of it was the captain, Erin Phillips, her father, uh, her grandparents were people that I knew from when I was the physio farmer back in Woodna. So it was just, it was just a, a round circle. So um, I, I have a passion for sport. Um, if, and I, I'm an armchair Olympics. Um, if I don't know the sport, by the time I see it the next time, I'll know all the rules and I'll be able to offer comments on it. I get teased about that by the family quite a lot. Uh, but having, I needed to know the sport as well with being a physio. I needed to know uh, what would be the, what were the injury causes and what, more importantly, how, how fit did I have to get somebody to get them back in the game? But I also treated lawn bowlers as elite athletes because they are. They need to know to do how to do the um, how how to get the very best out of their game. But the farming aspect of it, well, um, we introduce waterbeds uh, on you know, at Woodnut when um, when before there was well it was before there was bulk handling because the farmers' backs were so stiff in the morning they'd get injured before they could get going. But the waterbed would keep them supple in the night because if you um, boil your boil your bones and the broth settles, it becomes jelly. So you've got to warm the jelly before it becomes liquid. So that happens in the joint. So that's why people are so stiff in the mornings and they, they can get hurt before their jelly softens. So there was a company got company would put the water bed in the house and if the person wanted it after a, a month, they bought it. There was dozens and dozens of sold. It was really, that was, you know, that was still the area that they had mirrors up the top and velvet in other places. But um, it meant then that these people were actually had function. And then when we went to New South Wales, one of my key people, um, he was a gun shearer, a uh, shearing sheep. He could shear over 200 a day, which is week in, week out, which is a gun shearer. And he hurt himself. And I said, well, go back to shearing. He said, I can't. I said, well, what about the harness? He said, what harness? So we introduced the shearing harness into the central west of New South Wales and he got back into shearing. I worked my butt off as a physio to buy a cattle property up at Nimbin because it grows really nice grass other than the stuff that people smoke and get into trouble with. And um, I, I was using the green illustrator rings that we use for our animal hus husbandry in South Australia, but they never knew about it. So I could mark my calves, make them steers from bulls, for whatever day of the year I chose to, whereas they were cutting them with knives and they had to wait when there wasn't a fly attack. So now that's being sold in the, in the, um, in the husbandry shops locally. So that's just one of the other things. And of course, well, as a physio, when you're introducing um, best practice in how to do abdominal work and how to look after uh, your stuff. Um, and so um, one of the best ways was, because most people are doing abdominals by putting their feet under a cupboard. So you, you go to the footy ground, because I was, I was fortunate that I was invited into these areas, and you'd ask who was the best at doing abdominal crunches and so they'd line him up and so then I'd put him with his heels on the ground and to do it properly and he couldn't move he'd get their attention oh the other way you get their attention is um uh, what's the best exercise to improve your sex life and that's the kegel exercise or the um Hartman's exercise so you used ways and means of grabbing people's attention to get your message and I also do that now whenever I'm invited to speak about best practice for dementia as well. Well, that is a perfect segue because one of the things that I want to talk to you about is you presented a paper for elder abuse. And if you can explain to us um, what that conference is. But if I remember correctly, it was called uh, Not Being Believed is Abuse. 
And I think just that statement alone is really important. So if you can tell us the, what the conference was about and what drove you to, to, to write that paper. It was the International Conference for Aging and it happened to be in Brisbane. It was the 13th one. And I come across the agendas and it was, uh, the stream was elder abuse. And I'd had a, I'd had a couple of run-ins with um, a um, clinical uh, physician and then two psychiatrists. And basically, they didn't believe my self-reporting because they, they, they only went on what they saw. And as you can see, I present really, really well. You only need to, but if you spent even a couple of hours with me or spent a day with me, you would realise that I have a lot of deficit. But they, I found out later that the clinical guy only did 5% of self-reporting. And so he was saying, you have late onset schizophrenia, bipolar, and not dementia. And I'm thinking, excuse me, you think that's a kinder, a kinder statement? And then I go to the psychiatrist to get help with insomnia because the Aricep, which was, gave me my life back, also meant that I didn't sleep well. And they were just saying, you've got to go off it. And I'm thinking, I'm a locked in zombie. And, but they didn't, they didn't listen to my husband. They didn't listen to the other family members, their written statements. They just went on what they saw on the day. And I thought that was incredible abuse. And so that was what put fire in the belly to deliver that paper at that conference. And um, it was one of those one of those times, you know, the national conference, over 600 delegates from 38 odd countries. And very first morning session, uh, Dr. John Baird, who was the convener, had said to me, is there any anything, any, anybody has any statement? You know, and I'm thinking, well, I, I, do. I have four ways of finding Lewy body dementia early. And so it's basically IQ drop, more than 20, three to four cerebral funnies, a whole page full. Um, and then, um, and now there's a, a Lewy body's, oh, fast feet, fast feet, you can hear me tap. If you can't, it's either Parkinson's or Lewy body's full stop. And then another one is now there's a Lewy body composite risk score and sat down. And so I guess I was noticed. So when it was time for me to speak in my little room instead of the obligate, you know, the complimentary 10 or 15, the room was crowded with 70 or 80 side rooms. But after that, I went and apologised to Dr. John Baird saying, you yeah, know, I'm sorry for, you know, great, you know, taking over that thing. He said, no, but I know you. I'm thinking, you're not one of my patients. I don't really, don't forget them. He said, I was on the board of public health in the um, Northern Rivers Primary Health Network when you became a acupuncturist physiotherapist. So you were the first acupuncturist physiotherapist in Australia and I became an acupuncturist. And his body language was, you got that right, you probably got, got it right about the dementia as well about the finding Louis bodies. Because I was so fired up because of Robin Williams. I think that was the saddest thing out. That poor bugger had Louis bodies. It wasn't recognized. I actually read his autopsy and his coroner's report. And I picked six of the Louis bodies conference with score in it. If he had been treated differently and not given that massive antidepressant, inappropriate medication, he may, may have still been with us. But that's the background of not being believed as abuse. Well, I, I find it fascinating. And I think it's so important for the voices of people living with the disease to be heard. I mean, that's why I started Alzheimer's Speaks to begin with was, you know, my mom lived with the disease for 30 years. And I think she lived that long because she had so much to teach me and that we needed to change how the world dealt with this. And, you know, to me, people living with a diagnosis are the true experts. Nobody knows better than someone living with it. And 
and why, excuse my language, but why the hell we don't accept that as fact blows my mind. You know, we can read all the books and we can take all the tests that we want, but like you just said, it's a snapshot in time. It is not an overall thing. And I remember a million times my mom um, would rise to the occasion. Even when my dad died um, and we were at the funeral, people were like, well, she's fine. Because she stepped into her role of taking care of everyone. She really kind of disassociated that the man in the casket was her husband of so many years. And, but she, you know, her soul just raised up and she was so gracious and so caring, which is who she always was. And that's all anybody saw. They didn't realize that she didn't really make this connection of that was her husband of almost 50 years there. And thank God she didn't at that time, because that would have been devastating. But um, I don't think most people look at not being believed as a, a form of elder abuse. I look at and I see so many people online with the diagnosis that are bullied, that are told they don't have the disease, they're nothing but a fake. And, you know, it makes my, my blood boil. I have seen people's speeches and the way they write them out and the the font difference and the colors that they use. And it's like, I can't even read this thing, but they get up there and it's smooth as pie, um, but they've learned to adapt, to, to figure out what their brain needs to see. And then when you add a cause and a purpose behind that, I think, uh, I, I, and this is what I've heard from people with dementia, and please correct me if you if you don't agree with this, but they say this raise in purpose kind of stalls off the disease. You know, it gives them another mission. It gives them an area of expertise where, where they know they're, they know they're the expert. Others may not view them as that, but they're all out to change that and to educate people and to have a non-threatening conversation. And I just think that so needs to be done. I don't think there's anything much worse in this world of not being believed. And I've heard many stories where people are like, no, you're psychotic. No, you're depressed. No, you're this. No, you're that. And, and you know, like my mom was told for 10 years, she, it was her hormones. And my mom would say, you know, this ain't my girlfriend's hormones. I mean, over and over, she would say that she knew something was wrong. Now, given that was 36 years ago, people didn't really talk about it, but she somehow, some way she knew. And so I just um, value you and others like you who are willing to stand up and make these statements because I think part of it, you know, in just your title, not believing is abuse. And, and all of us at some time in our life can go to that spot and go, gosh, I remember what that felt like. Cause it's, it's happened to all of us. Now you, um, you also can kind of enlarge that concept on who cares for whom, when uh, when dementia hits the family. So if you'd please talk about that, I would I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm just, I'm finding your insights fascinating. So thank you, Val. Thank you, Lorelei. My, my husband's a Vietnam vet with PTSD and he had the misfortune of also then losing his arm below his elbow. So I've been his official carer since 2004. Um, that's when he got his finally in his 50s when when these vets get into their 50s they can't oholic hard enough they can't work hard enough drug hard enough drug hard enough however they kept the demons down they can't do it anymore so they need to get professional help and he got his professional help and so um, i became his official carer in april 2004 and so then so that's been my role and once, and you know, I don't have a, a good strong physio thumb for nothing. You will go to the doctor 
regularly. You will take your medications every day. And basically, you will pull your head in and look after yourself. And, you know, his health has improved dramatically. Um, and then he got to be uh, 56, all the paperwork was done, and he said, I want to travel. And if you want to travel and meet with me, you have to sell your practice. Now, that was, oh, God, that was my life. That was my passion. I was extremely good at being with complex pain was my specialty. I had the ear of 30 GPs and a dozen specialists. And um, I was a, a local icon, bowel physio. I was talked about in, in ordinary, ordinary speak. But then... Then the world started to slip off for me it, because I'm out at the farm doing all of this role, putting 500 trucks over wave bridges, doing all the paperwork to what goes into 30 odd silos, making sure that um, the various trucks get out to the various paddocks with the right grade. But I started to slip cogs. I'm getting lost on a property that I knew like the back of my hand. I'm making mistakes, but only, only. Laurie's seeing them, but the, the nephews are saying, what's wrong with Auntie Val? Um, so then they're having to text me the message. I could do one, two and four. I could do one, three and four. But when you've got paddocks that are 1,000 acres and you send them into the wrong end of the paddock, they're not really impressed, particularly if there's a boggy creek in the middle or something. So um, both Laurie and I knew that I was in trouble. And he'd just be, he'd just be, he stopped saying the wheels are, you know, you're losing the plot because it was too, too painful. And so it was a matter of he was getting very frustrated with me. And then I had um, autonomic disturbances and I couldn't, I couldn't handle the heat. I physically can't handle the heat. So if it gets over 31 degrees, um, I, I, I'm sweating and we've got air conditioning in now. And, and I'm literally dripping. So this is part of, and I have a pain syndrome with the autonomic disturbance as well. And my blood pressure goes silly. And if I have an anaesthetic, I, I just told the, the lady when I had my hip repaired, I had a fractured knot uh, end of July. I said to her, look out for me or I'll give you grey hair. Um, because as soon as she put me under, my oxygen sacs plummeted. I have a CPAP machine to blow air up my nose to remind my brain to, to breathe, up, up, breathe up when I go to sleep. So, um, yeah, so it's that, that quandary of when somebody of that older generation who's been waited on hand and foot and had their every need met, we, have, we call it in our house the Arnold syndrome because we have an Uncle Arnold who's, bless him now, he's passed, but he was in his 90s and he married this beautiful Austrian lady 10 years younger to wait on him hand and foot, you know, to wait on him hand and foot so much that he came out of a nursing home and demanded that she did all the caring, including the showering and etc. not taking into care that, that she'd had cancer and back surgery and all sorts of stuff. So if either of us are getting too bit over the top, we, 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 we get called Arnold. And it's time to, to back down a bit. So the who cares for whom is, um, is that other quandary that so many families face, We're even in any chronic illness as well, is when um, the roles shift. And you can teach old dogs new tricks, both John or There's a lot of people, including professionals, who didn't think our marriage would survive because... Once I started to have the filter damaged and started to straight talk and started to call, call bullies for what they were and they had to, and they couldn't use anger and intimidation to control me anymore. Um, yeah, there's been a few, a few good blues with varying people, including my husband. He's called Bestment because uh, uh, the other people... Kate Swaffer has her bub, a backup brain, and I'm, I'm calling him Bestie. And he said, no, 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 I've invested over 50 years in you and I'm the best at it. So he's my bestman. So bestman and me get on quite well. We have a robust marriage. We're going to be married 50 years next year. And, um, yeah, so it's, um, 
I went, I went over to New Zealand to present that paper and because I know that the slides are uploaded, the slides are fully packed with a whole heap of other information. There's about four talks in that one. And um, I backpacked New Zealand for, for nearly three weeks. I had quite a few adventures that uh, some he knows about and some he doesn't. And, um, but I went to Auckland at least four days before so that I was in good order to present the paper. And the DIA people and, um, and the uh, ADI people in, uh, in New Zealand were, were very gracious and, and, and caring and made sure that, that I was in good order to do. And I was wise enough then to make sure my slides were uploaded early, do all the right things and make sure that you're calm to present and stuff. And that opened up a lot of discussion of who cares for whom. And it, it's a load on families. I have, I've done all the paperwork. My, my guardians are my husband and my younger daughter who's an RN. I wear a do not resuscitate bracelet. You resuscitate me, I will see you. Um, in case I've got it wrong. Um, people say, but you're living a good standard of life. And I said, well, I am now. But I, I've, I've known dementia for nearly 50 years. I've, I've observed it in the community. I've worked with it. I was a consultant physio, for God's sake, in the, the local RSL life care. I introduced pain relief slow release morphia. I didn't know Louis bodies, I didn't know corticobasal, but I knew pain. And so we, we re brought, brought in pain relief correctly. And now that's the best standard practice because the staff, there's not enough staff, they've got to use patches. So I've always been on the front foot, creating storms, but not, not, not to stir the pot just for the stirring sake, but but to make changes and I've got a flat forehead from banging against how many situations so um that was that was an absolute delight and so that's up that's up on um, um on google if you want to google Valerie Shacky there's, a, there's some stuff there that I presented I've also got a paper on bold as a hyena because I can't think of an animal that's bolder than a hyena <laughs> Well, first of all, I, I have to say that I love the relationship you have with your husband. It's honest, it's fluid, you're still exploring, you're still living life. And, you know, that's to be honored. Um, instead of folding up and giving up, which a lot of people um, kind of are told to do. And so they, they just do it. Um, they, they don't believe there can be life after diagnosis. And I mean, I still hear that from people um, going to the doctor, you know, the last thing they hear walking out the door is get your affairs in order. And, you know, that's really it. They might get a prescription. They usually get another, um, another appointment. But as far as resources or belief or hope, there still isn't the direction I think that needs to be needs to be given. Um, now, you had also mentioned two organizations. One was um, ADI, which is Alzheimer's Disease International, and the other is DAI, and that is... Uh, Dementia Alliance International. Um, I, I found them, and it was the first time I'd laughed since my diagnosis. You, you, you have to have a form of cognitive impairment or dementia to actually be a member of DAI. You can be associates. But DIA, um, under Kate Swaff, who's the CEO now, there was eight people who set it up six years ago. They're, they're world changers. They've actually got a, got a place on the table at the World Health Organization. Um, they've been in the bonnet for um, so many people because they're, they're, they're showing a better way. And um, ADI, I'm, I'm still cranky. Why the hell are they just saying Alzheimer's? Um, in Australia, when I was diagnosed, I didn't go to Alzheimer's Australia because I don't have Alzheimer's. And so I had that two, oh, 18 months or whatever of, of, of torment and, and being in the dark. You need to keep people alive for the first six months after diagnosis because it is so tough. 
And so I, I had 11 ways of creatively popping myself and having my, and having my uh, insurance policy paid out. And then it got really real because I'd already fudged my way through a psychologist had to a point, you're fine. I'm thinking I'm not. And when it got really, really real, and I went back and I said, I am not, I am not okay. And, um, and it was around about this time that I found DAI as well. And, and with that group, you can just be yourself. I often talk now of being a netherling. I'm neither, I'm neither nor. I don't fit into the ordinary community. And often I present too well to be comfortable, other people to be comfortable with me within the major world as well, unless it's with DAI where there's some others similar to me. So um, they, DAI has been my lifeline. I was invited to join Dementia Australia Advisory Committee. That was three years ago, the DAC. And just today I sent off an email to say that I, I, will, I will agree to another three years, please. I still think I have a lot to contribute, knowing that if things go pear-shaped in, in my husband's health or my health, that I can just step aside. So, so they're the avenues. And now there's a memorandum of understanding between Dementia Australia and DIA. So, so now, now they're in the same camp. Uh, I can support them both. And so Dementia Australia is basically saying, get involved with the DIA face to face because they do it so well. And they do it all over the world. And with COVID now, they've got an extra session on a, on a, during the week because people were being locked in. In Australia, people are still shut in in Victoria. Um, we're a lot freer here in, the, in Northern New South Wales. So, you know, they're, they're, they're proactive. And if you want to know what's current, and I also set up um, the DAI Brain Health Hub with Maria and uh, Paula uh, talking about best practice, you know, the Bredesen type protocol, the, 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 um, the MEND and the FINGER and the, all these other acronyms of basically um, of improving, improving your health. Um, I'm always one of these, you know, aim for the 1%. This, this follows on from when the uh, UK bike, bicycle team were, you know, amongst the top 10 in the, in the world, but they weren't top. And they got a new coach and he said, pulled in the 15 people involved. And he said, I each want you to lift your game 1%. And so now UK are the world, world champions and continuing so, because that 15% improvement meant they were they were now gold medalists so that's where when i talk about improving your one percent you can improve your one percent over a wide enough area you can improve your quality of life significantly and so you have bredesen talking about i think it's 36 holes you now talks about in terms of the brain injury or blood brain barrier issues and but the seat the the Art of the game is what ones are rele relevant to you because each person is individual. So there's, for the ordinary person, there'd be four holes to plug. For someone with diabetes, there'd be six to eight. For someone with a type one diabetes, that I'd say 10. Someone with dementia has at least 15. Now I'm conscientiously plugging 19 because I have issues from having been the farmer with heavy metals. So I do hair analysis into clinical laboratories and chase the heavy metals. I'm also, unfortunately, had been irritated by the um, compliments of the POMs um, from Maralinga in the 1950s. We'd fill the warp in our chest and see the cloud. So there's all of those things. There's so, so many horrible cancers and the birth stuff that's come out of, come out of those bomb clouds of that era. And, and then you think about, well, that's when sugar started, you know, became uh, an epidemic. That's when margarine was introduced and meant to be a superfood, bloody two steps short of plastic, and, and butter was downgraded. Um, so my bit is, depending on your age, I'm saying, well, I'll say, great grandma just doesn't call it food, it's not, regardless, regardless of the advertising that goes with it. 
So I have an acronym CRAC, carbonated, reconstituted or refined, artificial and processed. To stay off it. So that's your soda pops, your, your other drinks. So you're going back to your basic foods, just simple basic foods, four ingredients type foods. And um, the most other important thing is sleep. You've got to get, got to get restorative sleep. I used to brag about how little sleep I needed. Oh, it's biting me in the bum now. Because you've got to go to bed on an empty stomach. Um, so you don't eat until two and a half hours before you go to bed. And then if you've got sugar or insulin in your body, they're the bullies. So they little Pac-Man of mac macrophages have got to chew them all up. And then only after that's gone, then the autophagy repair stage starts. And so if you're still having a cup of tea and a biscuit and sweet tea at 10.30, you never get to restore your brain or the other cells in your body. So that's probably one of the, the biggest things is, is go to bed on an empty stomach um, and that nightly fasting. There's, a, there's a, um, a sweet spot between 12 and 16 hours of nightly fasting. Mine is 13 and a half. And if you can fast, you know, fluids only for three days, you can re-switch on your immune system. And I've done that several times as well. The other thing about is please, please get tested for sleep apnea. That's a really simple one to fix. Um, if you, you've got to understand that dementia takes 30, 40 years to show symptoms. So you've got to start looking at from your 30s to 40s or even earlier. And so the other thing I would do differently is I would not have let my waistline get bigger in my mid-40s. I tore a hamstring badly. And after that, I just wasn't able to be as active. So, and I've always battled blood pressure. I would have screwed it down even harder. At that stage, 140 over 90 was considered normal. Now they're talking 120 over 80. So it's that midlife obesity for women. I would have I would have begged to go on HRT, even though it was I was 57 when when I finished the menopause, because the long, longitudinal studies show that HRT actually pr uh, protects the brain. And it's a matter of, um, I think it's, not sure the commuter, I think it's Bredesen talked about a colonoscopy. You know, we have colonoscopies regularly, and I was found at 55, and I have to have regular colonoscopies because I, I um, grow little nasties that could be bowel cancer. If we had colonoscopy starting in our mid-40s, what are your risks of getting dementia? And you can start battling it. Having it again a decade later, what are your risks? And, and just, we, we would stop this epidemic in its tracks. Well, you, you've said, you've covered so much. Um, I don't even know where to start. Um, one thing that I do want to kind of go back on is when you had said, I can, I can now represent more than one organization because they're not feuding. And that was a real big thing. And for some organizations, it still is. And people need to understand that. Here in the US, uh, for example, the Alzheimer's Association would um, claim an ambassador and they couldn't speak unless it was their script. Um, and so, and they were locked in for like a year um, at a time. And that has now changed um, because people push back and said, well, I want to talk over here and they want to know about this. And they're like, but you're our ambassador and it's our script. And that ownership has sliced it because it really is uh, an honor to have that voice represent you, um, but you, you need to let that voice be heard in its totality, um, in its authentic, uh, authentic voice, which I think is really important. Um, you had mentioned about, you know, Alzheimer's Disease International, you know, why, why don't they change their name? And I struggle with that as Alzheimer's Speaks, but for Alzheimer's Disease International, I, I think, and I could be wrong here, the reason they don't change it is because they're the association of Alzheimer's associations. Now, Alzheimer's associations here in the States 
um, started throwing in words like dementia and doing different things because they were seeing other organizations kind of coming in and taking up their what they believed was their space and was now competition with them and so they've kind of broadened the band but they haven't changed the name for me i've thought about changing my name but i think i have a pretty good reputation in terms of brand that people know we raise all voices not just from different types of dementias but people at all levels as well so a person with dementia is is valued just as much if not more than an expert or a business professional or an author or a musician or a music director because every, i believe everyone's voice is important as long as it's in a respectful fashion and that we can ignite change when we raise uh, when we raise that the the other reason i i'll say i haven't changed uh, my name was uh, one because of brandy but two there's a lot of people that don't like the word dementia either and then if i change to that and then what are they going to call it you know and, and so it's like i don't want to spend time and energy trying to figure that out. I'd rather, for me, push forward and hopefully through voice and through inclusion, people understand what we are. Um, just like the word caregiver versus care partner versus care companion, you know, we have to educate people on the differences and the impact of word choices and and all of those types of things and none of that happens happens overnight um i i love that you talked about sleep because i don't think people understand that enough i know i still am a, a late night eater which i know i shouldn't because i can be i can be in bed and sleeping real sound and then all of a sudden my stomach's roar, 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 you know and it starts talking to me and then i gotta get up and i disrupt my sleep and and i know better um and i've gotten better at it than what i used to be um because i am kind of a night owl anyways uh but you know you talked about so many things. One of the questions I was going to ask you was, you know, through your journey um, of dementia, it, which you were diagnosed about five years ago, kind of address this, what changes would you have made earlier um, if you would have known? And, you know, again, that typically isn't coming from our medical profession. And, and, and just you know, educating people on this way before a diagnosis hits so that they can have more control over their health. But, you know, here in the U.S., you know, we, we talk how we are not preventative. You know, we, we try to pretend like we are, but we're not. Um, and I know your medical system is, from my understanding, more of a social medicine and, and you've got more I think you guys address things faster than we do. You know, we're like way behind the eight ball and it's hilarious because everyone's like, well, we're the United States. And, you know, and it's like, no, we're not all that. Let me tell you, let me tell you, we, we are really not all that. We're getting better and we're making strides, but we are leaps and bounds behind other countries. And the, um, the acceptance and the graciousness and the government getting back um, behind these programs. I mean, most of our programs, um, and granted, there are some grants out there, but a lot of it is just straight volunteerism. Um, and it's, it's passionate people um, like myself and others that say this can't go on and great sacrifices are made in order to make those changes because there's still kind of this feud of, well, this really isn't a priority. And it's like, wait till it hits your family because it will, it will. So um, anything else that you want to add in terms of, of what you wish you would have known um, or what you hope people going in getting diagnosed now know yeah. that, that maybe you didn't okay so the most important thing is I'll, I'll just address first your title of your show if it's not broke don't fix it but in terms of national organizations 
uh, Alzheimer's is only is only one form of dementia. So they need to they need to call it dementia so that all the other over a hundred, I think there's 131 now, can belong. So um, what I well, it, it's happening now that we now have Dementia Australia, and I would be hoping that in every every time that someone is diagnosed, that they're also given the information pack that's available from Dementia Australia that has a dementia guide in it, uh, so that you can refer back to and has a you know and has that um, I'd, I'd say let's make it a fridge magnet the. 1800, 100, 500, because it's such a shocking diagnosis that, well, for me, it was a relief because I was finally vindicated because nobody, none of the professionals didn't think I had it. Um, that should be available because like, like any major life-changing diagnosis, you can't take it all in at once. So to have the resources. In Japan, they actually have someone like myself who's, who's worked through and can offer hope in the next room for the family to go and talk to and to pick the brain with and to have a contact with. That would be just so kind and so helpful. We have a dementia outreach service here in Ballina, but it's for over 65s. So because I was 63, I, I didn't find it. And so there was a newspaper article about a dementia-friendly community forming in my local town, which I'm now co-chair of. And um, so basically going to your information centre and finding the information you wanted to know about dementia. I was just, I was just being a smart ass, like just a throwaway comment. Oh, do you have anything, any about dementia in balance? Because I've been looking for six months. And couldn't find anything. I'm thinking I'll have to find, I'll have to start it myself. So I've been able to join. And we've had a, um, we've had a monthly uh, thing. And we're deliberately calling it dementia again. You name it. You claim it. You, you take the power of the hurt of the name away. And so uh, with, with COVID, that hasn't been happening. But it's now being enlarged. And so... I got, I got so hurt by the people that I'd see crossing the road so they didn't have to talk to me. So once I realised that I was going to survive and I was going to thrive and I was going to educate them. So I went to the pubs and clubs and I went to my previous clients. And I'll pick on Patrick because he's got broad shoulders. I just went into Patrick and I just said, Patrick, I have dementia. He said, yes, I've heard. I'm sorry. He said, I said, you will still greet me with a hug or a handshake and you will still invite me to the shindig that you did previously. You will include me. Sometimes I can say yes, sometimes I can say no, but please treat me as a person and, and include me. And I do that at the various places just to try and help them to get it. I said to him, look, you guys are really good at looking after your mates who've had a few too many beer. I mean, I'm a bit like that. I'm a bit over the top now. I'm a bit loud. Don't know when to shut up. But you know how to look after them. You include them. And you do it well. They at least will sleep it off the next morning and wake up with a sore head. But I wake up with no difference. Because my dementia is a, is a reality and continuing. So it's that sort of front foot action, that sort of, and I was a veteran affairs darling. I was able to talk to these crusty old fellas so, um, and, and just tell them straight. So I, I, I'm doing that as well. And um, fortunately now that I'm sleeping, I'm no longer as, I have some fil more filters intact. So I'm a little more polite about what I'm saying to whom and when and why. I have a savant type knowledge because it's my anterior temporal lobe that's damaged. If I've read it or heard it, it's there. And if you ask it, it's, I'll tell you. But now I'm learning to um, let's couch it in kindness. I love that you were bold enough to go in and say, you will do this. You, you will be inclusive. And then you gave him examples of, hey, you do it for everyone else. Why, why not me? 
Um, one of the things that I'm hearing people say in living with the diagnosis is what they're seeing um, with COVID now is so many people feeling the isolation that they felt upon diagnosis, that disconnection, that I don't know what to do. And, they're, and a lot of them are kind of smiling and laughing going, we can teach them. We can teach them because we've learned to work around that. We've learned other ways to connect. Um, and I, I think that that is um, a, a beautiful lesson out of this. And I think all people, for the most part, are appreciating the importance of our human connections, our relationships. Um, we're seeing people saying, if I have to choose now between work and my family, there really isn't much choice. It's going to be my family. And we're going to live differently because these are, and it's making people look at priorities. It's making people realize, gosh, we, we didn't play a game or we didn't joke around or we were just all so busy. And then we wondered why we were so segregated. And, you know, it's, it's brought people back together in a, in a weird way, um, which I think is real beneficial. I loved when you talked about uh, Japan, leveraging someone who's diagnosed, someone who's processed the, the depression, the scariness, all of that, to be able to talk to families and say, hey, there's still a lot of life to live. Here's how you get connected. Here in the U.S., um, and they've actually expanded beyond the U.S., but um, they have dementia mentors where you know people can basically sign up and and have that one-on-one -on -one with somebody and again why larger organizations didn't ever figure that out is beyond me it's taken you know kind of like with um, dai it's taken people diagnosed to say this will help us we can help one another um, they remember you know, what it feels like to get that diagnosis. You guys know um, just the, the hit that takes, not only you, but to your family, to your friends and the changes. And, you know, you've learned how to maneuver and process things or just listen and validate somebody's feelings. You know, not that you can fix it. Um, those things are, are massively important in terms of support. So again, I think the voice of dementia is so critically important. Um, you guys have made great strides in terms of, of changing what people think it is. You know, it's not somebody just 90 years old that can't communicate folded over in a wheelchair that needs help being fed. Um, and people struggle seeing somebody like you going, well, that she, she looks she looks normal. In fact, she didn't screw up as much as Lori did on this on this video. You know, um, you know they're evaluating things, but it scares people to think if you could have it, then I could have it. And and that's I think one of the the greatest greatest fears. Um, you are doing so much to change the the trajectory of the disease and to to have that authentic voice and that heart and and to come with options it's not like you're just going to say this is the way it is but this is how you adapt you know this is let's get creative together to make this world better and it's and it's not just dementia i i i firmly believe what's good for dementia is good for all of the world and a lot of different diseases or just stages of life. You know, we can learn to be more accepting and more respectful and, um, and more worthy of friendships and relationships than a lot of times what we are as, as individuals. So I just wanna thank you so much, Val, for your time. Uh, today. It's just been amazing. Val, do you want to tell people what the best way to get a hold of you would be and, and touch base with you? I've, I have a, uh, oh, first of all, in terms, my, my catchphrase is, because I work with disabilities in the whole story, you get it right for dementia, you get it right for all the other disabilities as well, because the areas of the brain affected is that. Um, I have a Facebook page, um, 
Val's journey, dementia is a word, not a sentence. It's a closed group, but if you um if you look to be part of it, that's fine. But um, I, I'm chatting on a, on a lot of other sites as well. So you'll see me on Dementia Alliance International. You'll see me on Dementia Australia. You'll see me on Sarah Ashton's sites, Joining the Dots for Dementia. Facebook's my work. <laughs> so no, I, I haven't I haven't formally done a URL and on a blog and a thing. I just think that um, I've got I, I'm a bit busy at the moment and um, that's enough at the moment. Thanks. But I, I really really appreciated the chance to have this conversation with you.